Hello, hello everybody, it's your boy Prop Chop and we're back again with some more Kings and Generals. This is the Battle of Hastings 1066 Norman Conquest documentary. Let's get it. Previously in our mini-series on the year 1066, we have covered the invasion of England by the King of oh. Norway, Harald Hardrada, who was able to defeat the Northern English Earls, Morcar and Edwin, at Fulford, but Morcar. then was counter-attacked by the King, Harald II, at the Battle of Stamford Bridge, defeated and killed. Oof. Unfortunately for Harald, his kingdom was simultaneously under attack from the Norman Duke, William. In this video, we will cover this campaign and the pivotal battle of Hastings. Fun fact about us, we love tennis. So the good news is that this video was sponsored by Tennis Clash, the best mobile game we've played in a while. And the best part, it's free to play and the tutorial for the game is short but helpful, allowing you to immediately immerse yourself into the rich and deep gameplay of Tennis Clash. Go to the video description, click on these special links, support the channel, and... What was he trying to do there? Was he gonna kick him? Was he down? Clash. Kick him, bro! Go kick to the him. video description, and click on these big special links, the support fuck? the channel, and you'll get 200 gems and 500 gold. Tennis Clash has a great PvP system, and challenges full of cool rewards. What we love about this game is you can play with different characters, decide what ability you want to focus Wait, on. Did it say all hope for the second game one? Is you can play with different characters. Oh, hope. I saw all whole. Decide <laughs> what ability you want to focus on forehand, Jeez. backhand, or agility, and play one versus one live PvP matches with real players around the world in different arenas while progressing in the leagues. Our nickname in the game is Red Phoenix. So, what are you waiting for? Go to the video description, Red click Phoenix. on the special links, support the channel, and you'll get 200 gems and 500 gold, and maybe we'll have a tennis match soon. Beware of our forehand. That's not, that's, that's not something you say, brother. Beware of my forehand. Seemed as though Harold Godwinson's reign joke. was secure. Affairs in the awesome. south turned critical. Since discovering that the crown he considered his had been so unjustly stolen away, William of Normandy had been an incredibly busy man. The Duke oversaw the construction of an invasion fleet, while his army was not only made up of the Normans, but large quantities of mercenaries from other French baronies, Aragon, Hungary, Germany, and even okay, as far William. as Norman Apulia. All in all, 10,000 eager men gathered at Dive throughout August 1066. After sailing 120 miles northeast from Dive to saint valery William finally launched his seaborne assault at nightfall on September 27th two days after the Anglo-Saxon triumph at Stamford Bridge. Duke William's army landed at undefended Pevensey Bay the next morning. Treading carefully at first, the Duke ordered his ships anchored together, conducted extensive reconnaissance, and expanded an old Roman fortification near Pevensey. But William grew bolder with time, and sent a force of his knights to demand the surrender of nearby Hastings. The locals could have raised a force of 1,200, but chose not to, surrendering the city. Oh! In York, nice. Harold Godwinson was still celebrating and resting Harold. the army when That's he was informed of this disconcerting surprise attack on September 29th. Not overly concerned and confident oh. in his chances, the king gathered his elite Huskiles, sent off orders to his brother Leofwin for an assembly of troops in London and then sped back south as swiftly as Morcar and Edwin were ungrateful and refused to join Harald, probably hopeful that the king's war with William will weaken him. As he'd come mm. north, arriving in his capital by October 6th. Informed of Harald's triumph against the Norwegians and his imminent presence, William sensed an opening he could exploit. The Duke began torching the estates of Harold and his vassals in Sussex uh, to force the king into an unwise clash. That's fucked up. That's fucked up. Is that burning his places? To further decrease oh, is that, Harold's rep. Is that a Harold house? Burn it down. Is that a Harold house? Burn it down. God damn. Reputation. The Normans also concocted propaganda that oh. Godwinson had personally decapitated his brother's corpse after the fratricide at Stamford Bridge. <laughs> All this forced Harold to hastily leave London on October 11th, with by what all accounts was a motley army. 
compared to the force he could have mustered given a few more days of waiting. Its core was the veteran Huskarl elites that had fought at Stamford Bridge, okay. supplemented by thanes recruited in London, as well as fjordmen from Oxfordshire, Kent Fjordman? and other parts Freeman? of southern England. After marching around 50 miles to the south, through England's great Andredsweald forest, Harold Godwinson reached a vantage Oh, point. I love this. I love how... He, so he's given us an actual battle map of what's gonna happen. It's like total war. So we have the different uh, forces here, and then the coming. That, that is awesome. Hill. That's awesome. On its summit was a greyish apple tree, which had been agreed as the meeting point for Saxon forces arriving late. Moreover, as the point was located nearby a fork in the Roman road from Hastings, William's army would have to pass by if it was to move beyond the Pevensey beachhead. Soon after arriving at the hill, Harold's forces were detected by a group of Norman outriders, who okay. swiftly went back to Hastings and informed their duke of the enemy presence only about eight miles away. Itching for a chance to meet the Saxon king on the open field, but still remaining careful, William recalled all of his foragers and had the entire camp stand at arms all night, just in case Harold attempted another Stamford Bridge, while the Anglo-Saxons rested after a tiresome march. At daybreak, a Norman reconnaissance vanguard spotted the various banners of Harold's <laughs> army flying atop Coldbeck Hill. Behind them, they witnessed part of the English army still streaming out of the Andreswield to unite with their king. Realizing that Harold still wasn't really ready for a fight, the scouts reported oh. the news back to their duke. It's going out. By the time Norman units started approaching Tellum Hill, both rulers were aware of the other's presence. Atop the slope, William and his troops stopped to don their armor and take a rest before the clash began. So where are they gonna fight? Isn't it better? Like, okay, so Harold wants to attack him. Why not just hold the hill? Curious, I'm curious. Let's see what's gonna happen. Harold's I actually don't know shit about the story. Troops on like the top English of a story during these Which parts. cut across the path of the Roman road. Harold's army, 8,000. 1,000 Huskars, uh, 6,500 field militia. 500 Kent and Su Sussex militia. His center mostly consisted of 1,000 or so heavily armed, solidly armored, oh, and highly nice trained man. Huskiles, supported Horseman? by 6,500 feared militia spread between both left and right flanks. To shore up the strength of these weaker troops, the king interspersed smaller units of Huskiles amongst them. The remaining 500 were drawn from the county militias of Kent and Sussex. All of these soldiers formed a defensive shield wall at the command of their king, who positioned himself behind the center. Okay. It was clear to both commanders that the area's density okay, of so vegetation... Okay, so this dude has no fucking... He only has infantry. That's weird. That's very weird. Wow. The other dude has archers, he has horsemen, he has everything. He has a balanced arm. Wooded nature That's weird. would render any flank attack useless. Okay. So William sent his ranged units, archers and crossbow, Smart. forward in an attempt to prevent Harold seizing the ridge. Although these skilled marksmen spooked the inexperienced English fjordmen and prompted a few defections, huh? they failed what? to prevent their enemy's line forming. Descending from Tellum Hill. I mean, it doesn't matter if they have to, if they formed, why not just keep skirmishing? They don't have anything to skirmish, they don't have cavalry to chase your skirmishers. Just keep skirmishing. Alright, William's army 7.5k. Heavy cavalry 2,000 heavy ca Yeah, no way he's fucking losing this shit. 4,000 infantry, 1,500 skirmisher. William's 7,500 strong army fanned out at the bottom of the slope and Jesus drew up Christ. opposite and below the well-positioned Anglo-Saxon force. This 7,500 was made up of 4,000 heavy infantry, 1,500 missile troops, and 2,000 heavy Norman knights. It was now about 8 in the morning. The largest non-Norman contingent, the Bretons under Alan Rufus, wheeled left and took up position on the western end of the valley floor. The Duke of Normandy himself, 
along with his friends, companions and hardened Norman troops, manned the centre. To their eastern flank was William's smallest division, comprising retinues from Flanders, Picardy and other regions. Each of these three divisions was deployed with archers and crossbowmen in the first line, mail-clad footmen in the second, and mounted knights in the third. Approaching 9 a Purple boy has a huge disadvantage in this. Ah, it, he doesn't win this. No way. I mean, more because we yeah. the boy. But, Some writers describe know. how a minstrel known as Tayfair rode in front of Duke William and regaled him with the Song of Roland, an epic poem of the eponymous Frankish hero. When this enigmatic, troubadour-like adventurer was then granted permission to strike the first blow against the English enemy, Tefer galloped towards the Anglo-Saxon army, killed two of the men who what? came out to face him, and was then slain in turn. Then at roughly what? 9 a.m. They, they did a suicide bombing without the bombs. I don't think it's much effective without the bombs, though. <laughs> On October 13th, I probably helped a lot for the morale of these dudes. A deafening cacophony of Norman war trumpets sounded from William's battle line, and in their wake came the day's very first attack. One and a half thousand archers and crossbowmen advanced to the foot of Harold's Ridge and let loose a storm of projectiles directly at the Anglo-Saxon line. This uphill volley failed to have any significant impact, uh, and still... the skirmishers' missiles either harmlessly struck hostile shields <laughs> or flew far over their target's heads. With Harold Godwinson's tightly packed English army virtually untouched by the bombardment, William's heavy foot began ascending the Senlac Ridge slowly, beset throughout the entire climb by a constant barrage of javelins, Danish okay. throwing hatchets, stones. So they, they did have skirmishers, just not like long-range skirmishers. They only had like uh, spears and axes. I mean, it's still pretty effective with armor, right? I don't understand why this boy is rushing. Why are and even rushing planks this? of wood. Upon reaching melee range, the first Norman line was like, stabbed. The way I see this, if he fights here on these hills, his uh, archers are fucked because they can't do much, and his horsemen are like at a big disadvantage because they have to climb up the hill. And uh, if they had to fight here down here, this dude was fucked because he would always have the horses surrounding your army. You have archers shooting Dan at you. cleaved asunder in its dozens of men, but nevertheless grimly pushed on. Throughout the 30 minutes of grueling hand-to-hand -hand fighting, increasingly desperate Norman soldiers yelled their war cry of Dieu aide, a sister's god, as their verbal repost whenever the defenders managed to run through and throw back a particularly ambitious Norman soldier Anglo-Saxon warriors would defiantly shout out, out, out to the invaders. Out? Out? Much like the missile attack before it, William's infantry charge began ingloriously fizzling out after around half an hour, and this left the Duke with only one option. At a signal, oh, no. 2,000 of the most lethal heavy cavalry in Europe followed the banners and pennants of their hill? lords up the slope in support of the infantry. Brother. Brother, what are you doing? What are you doing, brother? Uh, of course these guys fizzled out. They had to climb a fucking hill or getting showered by javelins. Unfortunately for them, because the withering climb up the Senlac Ridge affected the horses bearing 250 pounds of rider and equipment, the Norman impact against Harold's shield wall Nothing. was relatively gentle, already hindered by the harsh uphill slog, and kept out of Harold's tightly locked infantry formation. The situation for William's troops was made even worse by the sheer lethality of Anglo-Saxon arms. When a Norman soldier got too close, the shield wall would open for a moment only for an Anglo-Saxon Huskarl to burst forth and swing his two-handed axe at the unfortunate victim. It was reported that a single powerful swing of this fearsome implement could cut through both a horse and its armoured rider like a hot knife through butter. Okay, I highly doubt that shit, but listen, it doesn't matter if it cuts through. If it strikes you, even if it doesn't cut through, it's probably gonna break everything in your butt. Not everything, but you're fucked. 
It wasn't too long before these stubborn Jeez. tactics began having an impact. On his left, oh, William's no. roughly handled Bretons simply couldn't take any more punishment from the Anglo-Saxon hostiles. Peasant foot no, soldiers and noble horsemen alike turned from their English tormentors and began hastily bounding back down the slope in a headlong retreat. Disobeying their monarch's express orders to okay, hold Okay, this is maybe how he's gonna lose this battle. Like, these guys should have held and started enveloping. That would have been the best thing. When, when they come here, they lose all their advantages. We still got shit ton of skirmishers. You have the cavalry now that they can, u they can be useful now that they don't have to charge uphill. Why, you fucking idiots? Fast, triumphant Anglo-Saxon Fjordman on Harold's right pursued their adversaries down the Senlac slope. Too much. Killing many fleeing enemy soldiers, but also rendering themselves vulnerable in the process. Nevertheless, the Breton flight exposed William's center to an attack okay. from his flank. And so the Normans too began pulling back uneasily. What are these guys down here doing? In a half-hearted measure to support his own undisciplined infantry, Harold's brothers, Leofwine and Gurth, led a general advance of the entire English line. It had some initial success, but then both magnates were killed and the attack petered out. With little to show for the deaths of two wow. valuable leaders, the Anglo-Saxon main force did not push any further and left the onrushers to their fate. Understanding the incredible danger of this moment, William and his fellow commanders acted quickly and decisively Envelope. to quell a venomous rumor that the Duke had been killed in the fighting. William removed his nasal guarded helmet without hesitation so that every one of his nearby okay. soldiers could see him. The bio tapestry even shows Eustace of Boulogne pointing to the Duke in what seems to be panic, trying desperately to show the troops their commander was alive. <laughs> in the rear, William's half-brother, Bishop Oddo, also managed to rally a good portion of the routed Norman left and turned them back to the battlefield. At the same time, the Duke of Normandy took several hundred elite knights from the center and launched an attack against the disorganized Fjordmen on near flat ground, perfect cavalry country. As Harold looked on unmoved but undoubtedly angered, William's heavily armored horsemen crashed into and obliterated the disorderly I mean, of course he'd be angry. The... Didn't two of his brothers fucking die? And like, a little bit of his flank get fucked. Probably not a little bit, half of his flank. It's... This turnaround reversed the Normans' backward momentum, putting an end to a mid-battle crisis which could have heralded the end of William's entire venture. Probably would have. With this masterful display of mounted warfare, the first stage yes, of the battle... Yes, this was masterful display of mounted combat. Not, not the thing before where you charge up a hill at people that are braced. <laughs> battle Jesus of Hastings Christ. came to an end at about 2 p.m. <laughs> After several hours, both sides had suffered considerable losses, resulting in a lull during which each army took a breather and readied themselves for further fighting. Harold could afford to draw the battle out, but William needed to win a decisive victory oh, that's why he charged. was finished. Okay, interesting. Fortunately for the Normans, their leader had picked upon a weakness in Harold's army that he could use to gradually wear down the enemy ranks. It was there. So, after a short break in the fighting, William ordered his whole line, cavalry and infantry both, forward for a second time in mid-afternoon. They had to get Harold off his ridge before nightfall, or all would be lost. A brutal melee once again developed across the entire front, but this time the Bretons were prepared. After a short while of heavy punishment, they once more turned and began to ah, flee the field. He's gonna fake the route from where they to try and see if they're gonna follow again so he can slaughter them again the, in the plains. By the way, why is he not using his uh, arrows here? Shouldn't he somehow try and like go from the back? Then again, it's a fucking ridge and we don't know what kind of hill this is. It might be impossible. But this ah. time it was feigned at yeah. William's order. Smart. Although this is a controversial and much debated aspect of the Battle of Hastings, it is likely that the lesser trained Fjordmen and even some Huskars were just waiting for the Bretons to run again. 
when some of the Bretons did as expected, the warriors they were facing gave chase. Their eagerness, however, was also to prove their downfall. Drawn out and vulnerable, the English contingents on that side of the field who fell for it were helpless when Breton cavalry quickly wheeled around, regrouped and charged. Scores of Anglo-Saxon troops were cut down in these small-scale tricks. This happened multiple times throughout the course of the afternoon. In the course of these constant feigned retreats, and throughout the front line fighting atop Senlac Ridge, William's assaults had gradually thinned the ranks of Harold's better trained and well-armoured Huskars. Many of the local Saxon thanes who had accompanied their king to the battlefield also lay dead on the field, their positions filled by fjordmen who were far from their equal in warfare. For Duke William, it was now or never. He ordered the Norman archers forward to loose a short, sharp barrage of projectiles above the heads of their own soldiers and Up into the English ranks from a high trajectory. Whereas at the beginning of the battle, Harold's ranks had been fronted by well-trained and stoutly armoured professionals, their Fjordman replacements were unable to shield themselves as effectively yeah, and were killed in droves by Norman arrows. When the Norman cavalry led by William subsequently charged up the Senlac slope, this time it achieved a breakthrough, punching through a large section of the devastated Anglo-Saxon line. Suddenly noticing Harold fighting nearby, the Duke ordered Eustace of Boulogne to assault the enemy leader. During the confusion and shock of the assault, Harold was shot in the eye by an arrow and then cut to pieces oh. by Norman knights. The king's death finally collapsed whatever remained of Anglo-Saxon morale. As the militiamen who remained alive began withdrawing towards the relative safety of Andrasweald Forest, Norman cavalry were able to wrap around the English flank and roll up its remaining soldiers. Although the feared fled for their lives, the remaining Huskiles, Thanes, and Harold's personal dead. bodyguard gave their lives protecting the late king's body. Duke William's gamble of engaging the Godwinson army as soon as possible had paid dividends many times over. Anglo-Saxon strength was utterly shattered, but William, who could now appropriately be called the Conqueror, did not immediately advance to claim the English capital. Instead, he returned to the Norman camp at Hastings and stayed there for five days, awaiting the arrival of an Anglo-Saxon surrender delegation. None came. Throughout the subsequent months, okay, okay, William wait. advanced. Morker and Edwin both vied for the throne, but the council elected Edward the Confessor, his relative Edgar, Aitling, instead. North and devastated the countryside, whilst cautiously circling around London like a tiger sizing up its unknown prey. <laughs> Although the Duke was wary of accepting the crown of England immediately, because of the sheer amount of resistance that was still to be quelled, he was persuaded by defecting Anglo-Saxon magnates and his own army. Fair After enough. a 350 mile roundabout march from Hastings all the way to London, William accepted the crown of England at Westminster Cathedral on Christmas Day 1066. Thus the Norman conquest ended the Anglo-Saxon era in England and the Viking Age in general, and started the Norman era. We have more videos on the history of England oh, right. on the way, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. Alright, I, I still can't believe he fucking won this battle. This should have been his last 100% after he did the fucking dumbass charge up here. He was... I, I don't know if it was luck, but I don't think he should have won this battle. I don't know, this feels like it was pretty lucky, let's be honest. What do you guys think about this whole battle?
let me know let me know in the comments anyway quick thank you to the channel sponsors Pedro Martinez, Kamasko, you know, Rob Berry, Swastery, Fuel Chicken 53, Sino Hilton, Lemon and Moon, Akma Dash, Ronic Nile James, Bzoni, Ruga Hideki 25, Michael Mizio, Nicole Yurgiev, Shari, thank you all for the support. I'm streaming some Rimworld today, continuing the Terminator Salvation Army thing. Hey, we'll survive, okay? I have turrets now. Anyway, see you next time, buddy. Have a nice day.